Okay. So ROS is uh, is a robot operating system. All right. Talk's done. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Everybody's so excited. Don't <laughs> so, what is ROS? It's a distributed, thin language, independent, tools based, free, and open source meta operating system for robotics. Well, that was a mouthful. Actually, what it is is you load Linux on a computer, then you load ROS on. Um, ROS does some basic things that allow you to do uh, more advanced robotics quicker. So, the idea is, is you don't spend a whole lot of time producing base platforms anymore. Um, you don't go to the laser cutter and cut out your platform every time you want to change your platform. You actually use platforms that have thousands of hours behind it. Um, so you don't actually have to worry about how the motor control works anymore. Because somebody has already spent a year and a half making sure that motor control is as finely tuned as possible. So you don't have to do that anymore. So that knocks a couple of years off of your circular time of making sure your pin loops are exactly correct and things like that. So. It's a, um, it, it's a, its idea was is to um, create a sharing platform so universities, hobbyists, and industry can collaborate together to produce better robotics, higher end robotics, and higher end thinking um, versus um, the separation that existed years ago and still kind of does today to where um, there's, there, the collaboration doesn't exist. Um, you, you get a square thing, put some motors on it, and that's really cool and it moves forward and goes but the, uh, the idea is, is now somebody at the university has made it to where it reads these encoders and understands these motors really well and does this platform really well you, uh, for you to do four square competition as an example all you have to do is code the basis of driving around in a square instead of coding how you read the encoders how much distance you have actually gone and those type of things because while that's needed and useful in robotics it's something that's been done for 20 years. We just keep repeating the same cycle, and the idea behind this is to stop that cycle, stop redoing the same things we started doing in the 80s and 70s. And, um, and let's move forward to more advanced robotics with that, uh, without having to uh, worry about building the base. So this covers who uses ROS. In the industry, Will Garage, Bosch actually uses ROS in their manufacturing process for the control of the electronic arms, those type of things. Uh, Vanium Labs is a big, big um, um, arm manipulation and uh, robotics company that actually uh, manufactures using ROS as its base platform for controlling the manufacturing environment and the robots. Um, the university is here using it. I'm sure you can recognize a few of those names, MIT, Berkeley, those type of things, and, and crazy people like us that want to do some uh, uh, cool stuff. And these are the robots that can use ROS. As you can see, I'm not going to go over all these. There's a whole lot of these. These are all base platforms that are ready for you to use today. You load on a module, you got a robot that has the features of the base platform already ready, built, and good to go. Quadrant coders, six wheels, four wheels, circular wheels, omni wheels, the whole nine yards. It goes through for arm manipulators and the whole nine yards. And um, so there's a whole lot of things in here. There's some highlights in here that I want to cover, uh, mainly because they're um, either way out of our reach or very easily in our reach. The ones that would be way out of our reach are like the Willow Garage PR2. That's a $400,000 robot. <laughs> That's pretty much out of the reach of most people in this room. I, um, and if not, let me know and we can have a conversation. <laughs> um, the, um, the, the uh, Cuckoo you buy <coughs> is um, cheap, a little over 200 bucks, and it's a platform that has four legs, easy manipulation, can go over rough terrain and actually understand um, the pressure sensitivity issues and interrelated with stepping over rough terrain, which is, if you guys have done any legged robots, it's actually a very complicated thing. Uh, the Prairie Dog, which um, you guys might have seen a few years back was a brown looking dog thing that, that was able to do kind of the same things and walk upstairs in the whole nine yards. Well, that's, that's what this is. Um, that's expensive, but, but it's very cool. Uh, there's some arms in here that are really awesome, that are really easy to use. Some of them are very expensive. Some of them aren't. Um, the, the other part down here in the mobile robots, and it's something that I know quite a few people in this group are actually using, um, the um, robot, iRobot, iCreate, the Roomba, as a, as a basic example. 
the Neato. Um, those are all proven robot platforms that you can pick up at the store. Go to Walmart, buy it. Um, and there's a few others that are in here. Um, the, the Billy Bot's uh, pretty cool, which is basically a turtle bot. This is the first rendition of the turtle bot, which is a I create with the Connect on it. And this is the next list. This is all the humanoids that can use it. I have one that's not on this list. It's called an Isobot. It costs $160. It's one of the smallest humanoid robots in existence. I um, mean, you can manipulate it directly with RAWs and control what you're doing with it with RAWs uh, from a laptop to a Wi Fi device attached to it. UAVs, uh, one of the ones that's also not on this list that's starting to be used. Well, actually, it is on this list. The AR drone, it's 300 bucks. Got a quadcopter that you're controlling with the, with the laptop. In fact, I know somebody in this room that has one, apparently. Um, there's uh, other U uh, um, um, UAVs that do the same work. I sent an email out about one uh, not too long ago. It actually already has a platform ready to be utilized with RAWs too. Um, the, uh, with, the, with how cheap Wi-Fi connectivity coming to your, um, um, to your controllers is becoming, it's become much more a reality to have a, a remote robot that's actually controlled by your uh, robotic brain that's elsewhere. Um, the other one that might be of interest to the people in this room is the Lego NXT, and I know there's a few people in here that are currently trying to do that. It's a very cheap robotics platform. The cool part about the NXT integration is you can actually design it in the in the NXT Lego layout, and then build the, and take that layout and import it directly into all the visualization and uh, mapping software, so it actually knows how your robot looks when you're visualizing it, and you'll see some of that later when we go through. But the idea is that you can, um, it knows the parameters and, and how your robot has to fit by how you built it, um, which is pretty cool for Legos, because that's one of the nice things about building it with the, the Lego set. Um, so this is where you can run RAWs. This is the part that is uh, uh, probably the most scary part about RAWs for um, users here is uh, the supported environments, the experimental environments, and the partial functional functionality environments. As you can see, Ubuntu is the thing here. What about Ubuntu 11.10? Um, it, it, it's, uh, um, go ahead. 11.04 uh, uh, is supported, 11.10 isn't currently listed as supported. Right. Okay. Uh, there's there's the ways it integrates with um, the environment that preclude it from going there. Somebody has to spend the time doing the conversions for all that. And, and, and in the current release um, actually runs on 11.10. You just have to custom load some packages that are um, not part of the normal repository based on new versions that are on 11.10 that weren't on 10.4. Okay. On it has to do with all the Python libraries and all that that's sort not of too crap. Bad. Yeah. Well, for a Windows person, that's a pain in the ass. They don't go next, 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 next. <laughs> 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 Guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> um, the experimental ones, uh, as you can see, are Slackware, other Linux-based stuff, or free BS, free BSD-based stuff, or BSD-based stuff like the Mac, the Mac, so on and so forth. The partial functionality windows, all it has is ROS core currently. It doesn't have any of the advanced uh, SLAM mapping interfaces and those type of things that allow you to run it. Um, the guy who is doing most of the work on that will be more than happy if anybody wants to help him get it going. Um, but there's not a lot of driving force beyond that. Um, the one I wanted to highlight, um, because it's uh, something that um, is cheap and we can utilize today as a robot controller, is the Android. Um, um, even if you don't have a smartphone, don't know how to use a smartphone, um, Android devices from three years ago, run at a 550 megahertz processor, have half a gig of RAM, have 16 gigabytes of storage, have video, GPS, barometers, accelerometers, gyros. That's perfect for a robot. And it's the size of this. So it has Wi-Fi access, Bluetooth access, all the cool things you'd want in a robot controller and a phone. Uh, today, I looked up the price. It's $23 for what I just described. Um, if you could buy a robot controller for that, that has all those features for $23, bucks, let me know and I will highlight that in the next talk. Um, it's very cool. Uh, or you can go with as advice as new as this today. Dual 1.5 gigahertz, 
dual cameras, whole nine yards, which you can actually do 3D stereoscopic viewing with this phone versus not. This is the PR2, which is the mother of what they produced RAWs for. As you can see, the cost is extremely expensive. It has two servers running eight cores on an i7, has 48 gig of RAM, has seven cameras, two of them being stereo, has two laser range finders, two arms that are four degree of freedom and a three degree of freedom wrist attached to it, so a total of seven degrees of freedom for each manipulator. Okay. So we can build it from scratch for a fraction of price. Actually, you can, and I, it's part of a video that I show later. It's actually pretty <laughs> cool. Uh, for a fraction of the price being right around $4,500. Um, with the laser cutter, knock that down by about half. Um, and then it has an omnidirectional base, so it can go around in a, in a um, nice tight circle, which is what everybody wants to do with their robots, so they actually know where they're going. Um, Roz is organized in some ways that are try to simplify how you communicate between all the devices. One of the things that you run into with uh, programming robotics is, it's cool, I got an accelerometer. That's great. Now how do I feed that accelerometer information in a, in a timely way into my core program so it understands how to util utilize that accelerometer information? And really what am I trying to do with that accelerometer? Determine how fast I'm going, determine the direction I'm going, determine whether I have slippage because my gyro shows I'm moving an angle, but my accelerometer doesn't show any movement, those type of things. So they made these things that make those simpler to do. And, and there's a lot of people that have created libraries that allow you to do cool things with this base packages. So you have nodes, messages, and services, okay? So a node is a piece of hardware, basically. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, Mess it, but it's a program that interfaces with that. Uh, uh, kind of. The messages are how the information is transferred in between. Okay, and then services are uh, are, are basically well, services. It's a uh, call return kind of model between processes in into process communication thank using you. sockets. Thank, thank you, thank you. Sorry, I was like there for a second. And then stacks are groups of packages. So there's a lot of people who have known stacks, and an example of a known stack is the NXT stack. The NXT stack includes how to use the color sensor, how to use the sonic sensor, and those type of things. And, and you configure your stack to say, well, the, the color sensor's on, on port one and the, and the sonic sensor's on port two. Now, now it's passing messages. I can talk and say, okay, I'm interested in listening to this message related to the sonic sensor. And every time the sonic sensor sends a message, your listener grabs it and does whatever it wants to do that you coded on the other side of it, or what somebody else coded on the other side of it. So these are the services that are provided by ROS. You don't have to worry about the hardware anymore. It extracts that out. The low-level device control, it extracts that out too. In other words, sending the right voltage to your ping sensor so it actually sends the proper ping, things like that. Um, because those are standard things in robotics. There's no reason to write that again. <clears throat> so they wrote it, it does all the capabilities, no reason for you to go do it again. The messaging passage, passing service, which is, um, again, like, it's, like I was describing in between the notes, where it'll, um, these messages can be passed anywhere. So to that laptop, to Google Goggles, to AC3 cloud network that's, providing you with a thousand machines to process your real point cloud library as you want to slice things about. So I mean, the, the messages are, uh, uh, are, are even as simple as from an Arduino to an Android phone. Um, the message is saying, I went one rotation for the wheel. It can be that basic all the way up to, here's a picture I took, what is this object? The name and parameter service, um, the, what, what it is, is this is really Ra's core, is what it's called. Its idea is, it's um, so an example today is on the internet. You go and type in www.google.com. Your browser knows where to go because it talks to a service, DNS, that tells it where it's located at, where to go get its information. There's some base ports that are standard for it. Well, Ra's core does that for you. It's the thing that you can say, okay, I'm going to register with Roscore that my sonic sensor's here, and it talks on this port. 
I'm going to register with Lodge Ross core that my sharp sensor is here and it talks with this port. Now, your other things that need to utilize that data talk to Ross core to determine where to get the information from. So you don't have to code the interlinks in between all that stuff. Ross core does all the pass of the pass off of that stuff. Um, and then some package management, which really isn't Ross's package management. That's Linux's package management. You yum it up. So one of the things I didn't cover last time that I want to cover this time is the functionality of ROS. And I know this is very uh, small, and but this is the focus of ROS and what functionality they're trying to bring to robotics. Mobility, perception, and manipulation. It's, it's three big circles. And where ROS is is right in the middle where all those three big circles meet. They try to, they're trying to make sure that you don't have to worry about base mobility of your robot. You don't have to worry about how your ro robot perceives the environment. They've created libraries that allow you to do those things without actually having to code them. There will be some examples later of what I mean by that. But a base example is, is a robot with a connect on it that actually can determine that Glenn is sitting in that chair and greet him properly. Have a conversation with him and go forward. So, so, so that's perception. Manipulation is, if it has an arm, it can shake his hand. And actually that's not too complicated with Ross libraries because they have basic arm control already built in. You have to choose a arm platformer. And then your perception of the connect determining where his hand's at that he just outreached and you pushed putting your arm to it. So what your code is basically wait for Glenn, shake his hand when he gets within five meters? Exactly. For whether it's five, a little bit more inches. complicated than that, but, um, but that's the idea. And so there's these service providers, some of them I already talked about, the master, it's a name server, um, which is implemented versus with XML, the parameter service, which has all the dictionaries of all the stuff that it um, has cataloged. A node is an executable component, topic is a message passing concept, and a, 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 a message is information that you're exchanging between the nodes. Again, I, my ping sensor went off and something six feet away. See, quick talk, right? How do nodes talk? Node A to node B. Sonic sensor, motor control. This topic it's listening to. Your motor control wants to stop when there's something right in front of it. It listens to the sonic sensor that knows what's right in front of it. These are how services talk. <coughs> Where is the sonic sensor telling me it's at? It's right here. Okay? Pretty basic messaging concept. And these are actions. I have a goal. The goal is I want to travel six feet. Okay, I can cancel that goal. I feedback status to the thing that it requested that goal. I give the result when it happens, and then there's some feedback loops in there. So if you need to adjust according, like, like someone who walks in front of it, you wanted to go six feet based off the old map. But a human stepped in your way, you need to recognize that fact and change your course of action to go around the human, as an example. So that's, that's why this loop exists, so you have a feedback of what's actually happening, so you can change what your corrective action accordingly to still reach the goal. How is feedback different from status? So status is along the lines of, um, so feedback is, is uh, more about the, 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 whole, the thing as a whole, and your status is I went a foot, I went a foot, I went a foot. How whatever interval you have your status is. In that example, they they tend to cross more in some more complex examples. Would the feedback be more exceptions? Normally, okay. Not always. So status isn't something like I've achieved my goal. No, it. Uh, yeah, that's the result. Okay. So this is the result. So okay. either I failed at achieving my goal or I achieved my goal. And so you must resend the information to have set up a new goal or those type of things. This feedback could be more like a trigger, I guess. The feedback loops that I've utilized that are involved in this are a human stepped in front of where I'm trying to go. Something got in the way of what I knew was six feet away. I have to adjust my goal accordingly. These are the libraries you can code ROS things with. The most commonly used one is the Python library. All of these exist and work just fine. ROS Java is actually, in the past few months, has shot up 
um, and the amount of work you can actually do with Roz Java. The idea behind Roz, Roz Java is what I was describing earlier, running on that $23 Android phone that's three years old and nobody's going to actually use as a phone. Um, <coughs> Roz Lu was, anyway, so, so the idea is if you know these two, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, and uh, uh, most things that we cover um, in ROS right now are this is the base stuff, this is actually how you do the messaging and the interfacing in between and tell the nodes what they're doing. Uh, Python's actually pretty easy in the extent of that Python's actually utilized in ROS for things that probably hobbyists care about. Um, is you write a library in whatever language you know on whatever computer you know well and, and you write it. <laughs> And then you write a Python wrapper that passes the messages back to Roz Core and the other device. <coughs> it. Um, so you don't actually have to write your whole thing in Python if you want. Make sense? Go ahead. Is there anything along the lines of basically, you're not a programmer, you're basically a GUI kind of guy? Lua would be the closest thing to that. It's a script language. It's just a, world of world of yeah, it's a cheap, it's a cheap visualization it script language. <clears throat> how, how far along is the Octave? <clears throat> Pretty far along, <coughs> um, but I don't use it, so I can't tell you how good it is, because um, I don't like that language by any means. Um, so these are some command line tools. I'll just highlight a couple that are important. Uh, ROS core, very important, it's like what everything, how everything runs. Uh, the ROS create package is really cool for like, an example of where that comes into heavy play is what Paul's going to talk about here in a minute. He's going, he's doing Arduino serial communication with ROS over Wi-Fi, right? Okay. <clears throat> Let's say that you, somebody else in this room wanted to utilize that for a robot they're building that has a chumby sitting on top or, or an Arduino sitting on top. He can create a package. Now you take that package and plug it in, his work you're now using without having to do the work. So it's awesome. That's part of the part of the joys of doing this. And you don't have to know what he did it in. You can interface with it with what, however you wanted to interface with it. So if you don't want to do Python, do C++. It doesn't matter. Ross Core handles all the messaging in between, all the conversations. You worry about coding in the way you know how to code it. Um, Roz stack is pretty cool, but only when you get very, very heavy into Roz, you can actually watch the messaging stack as things happen and, and to determine what's going on. Part of the things I like about it is Roz bag. One of the, one of the one of the hardest things in robotics, at least for me, is determining what the hell happened. Okay, it's really hard with multiple multiple sensors and multiple devices to determine what went wrong in a situation where something went wrong. Um, you either have to be paying attention live in the debugger with the USB cable attached or <laughs> Wi-Fi and all that other stuff or little log messages that pop up and say, I did this and I did this and this is what this said. Raw's bag allows you to take all the information from all the sensors, all the input and all the output that was collected during the process of your problem and replay it live. So you can record it and then come back later, <clears throat> play it change your algorithms and see how the robot would have responded differently without actually having to touch that robot. So you can actually fix your robot and replay an air event uh, without having to send your robot up and down the room over and over and over again. And then once you get to the point that it's finally tuned, send your robot down and it should work better because you changed your algorithms to respond to the input that you correctly, incorrectly responded to the last time. Does that make sense? It's, it's, that's, Probably the best feature I love about ROS is because why crap broke is the hardest thing to figure out when it comes to complex microcontroller systems. There's some GUI tools, ROS bag already talked about, but bag recording, playback, and visualization, ROS graph, so you can actually see how the sensors responded across the way for distance and things like that, so you can see how your sonic sensor was responding to the process, things like that. Uh, Roz plot, which is so you can watch all the topic information going across and see how the messaging happens. The reason why that comes into play is the idea behind Roz is you're not just using the microcontroller to control your robot anymore, you're using your computer that's sitting on your desk too. And so there may be some problems where the Wi-Fi gets disconnected, stuff like that, and that kind of shows you that the connection dropped and stuff like that. Uh, Roz console is uh, debug logging that people are normally used to, text output, hello world. 
and RViz, which is for 3D environment visualization. Um, and as a robotics topic, that's generally an advanced topic. People don't generally think about how can I map a room and know that there's actually chairs, people sitting in the chairs, um, there's tables hanging on the wall, there's a door there, these are where the lights are at. Um, and and um, most hobbyist robotics, that's not something you even quantify trying to do uh, because you have so much base you have to build to be able to get to that level. Um, our viz is the way it takes camera input and uses the base platforms that have that capability um, already for you. And this is why Mark's here today. Go ahead. <laughs> well, back on that last part, how much do you have to instrument your, how, do, how much do you have to know what you're doing to instrument your package to provide these things, or does it just fall out of the normal message? Or so are you talking about the Ross bag stuff? Or? Well, no, like the plots and stuff. Do you have to like add plot instrumentation to your package to make it useful to other people? All right, cool. So here's the interesting part about the way Ross works. Is um, so um, point cloud or pl uh, plot libraries, as an example, they have them. Okay. So you would take your camera <coughs> output and plug it into the point cloud library and it would re re result in a point cloud um, object of what you were just looking at, which then you can look up and determine what that object is. Uh, that's part of how it, it takes you to the advanced part of the robotics world. You don't have to worry about, okay, how do I determine a thousand points on this particular object that I need to pay attention to to understand what it is. Um, it, they, they, they take that, allow, allow the video feed correlated themselves, um, which requires a lot of processing power mind you, you can't do it to 72 megahertz processor sitting on a robot, generally that's pushed off. And part of the stuff I want to talk about is it's even pushed off even further now to where it's, um, uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of Google Goggles, right? Take a picture, it tells you what that is if you didn't know what it was, yeah, and it works for your robot. So you don't actually have to have a point cloud library, you just send the picture of what you just had to Google and it tells you that's a pixel. Find high one. power in terms of CPUs, like something like a Beagle board or a Panda board, going to be enough? Or yeah, you'll see. You'll, well, you'll see in a second. Um, <laughs> the the idea is, is if it's not, plug a computer in and have your Beagle board talk to the computer. If it's not, put in a 3G dongle and have it talk to AC3 or. Well, I mean, if so. if such Beagle board or Panda board is on the box, is that enough horsepower? No. No, um, not for point cloud libraries, just really that's heavy, 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 heavy um, uh, mathematics and things like that. And so this is the point cloud library. This is a, just a picture that's an example of what it can do today based off of images or video it takes. It can determine that there's toy cars, the sections of the toy car, which is cool. I can tell the hood of my Hot Wheel. <laughs> Not that I know that's absolutely necessary or anything, but um, what vases are, what clocks look like, what chairs look like, something sitting in a chair it doesn't recognize, it can then extrapolate this out and send it up to Google Goggles and determine that it's a heart-shaped pillow. That now you know what it is, and now you have a point cloud that determines what it is. Make sense? Mm -hmm. it, it, abstraction. Yeah. Yes. All the way up. <clears throat> That's huge in robotics. Yes, it is. Huge. It's the holy grail. Is what it is. <laughs> huge. It's been the holy grail for years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, what? I, um, before I get into some of the videos and things like that, which I have on another um, screen that I'll just tab over to, is what 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 I didn't go over very well last time is 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 some 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 basics. It's it's a uh, you don't build a platform anymore. If you do build a platform, realize that you're going to spend a lot of hours fine-tuning that platform so it, it can turn around in a circle and be dead center. You're going to spend a lot of time working with your pig controls and things like that, making sure your motors are in balance and things like that. With, with what they're trying to do is you don't spend time doing that anymore. You go buy a Roomba. Somebody's already spent five years making it that way. You're never going to get the time to do that. Um, by the time you get the time to do that, it's not going to be a technology you want to use anymore anyways. Mm -hmm. So so its idea is is, is it, it's, it makes it easy um, for people that have a little bit of money, doesn't have to be a lot, 
to take platforms and do advanced robotics without worrying about the nitty gritty of whether I've moved forward 10 inches. <clears throat> While knowing that you move forward 10 inches is important to the whole goal of what you're trying to achieve, there's not really reason to spend six months fine-tuning it to the point that you know you did move exactly 10 inches guaranteed. Focus on the innovation. You focus on, yeah, you focus on doing the higher level stuff on, okay, I really wanted to recognize faces and be able to determine friends as they walk into the room and greet them and then tell them where I'm at so they can come find me or maybe even show them where I'm at and drive them there. Um, that's the idea behind it, not necessarily um, making your robot go forward two feet. Make sense? Any questions before I get into videos that have a whole bunch of other context and show kind of how the pre, what I'm talking about is useful? No? Okay. So hopefully, thank you. So this is uh, a video that's uh, Roz, this is over a year old already. And this is the PR2 robot. Playing YouTube. It's a medical robot. Pancake flipping. These are libraries that are available for your robots to use today. LiDAR. 3D mapping. Slam mapping. Examples of such. And welcome to the DMS internet connection. <laughs> and I did queue all these up, that's the sad part. <sighs> do we let an obvious screen yeah. interlace this with the data files? Yeah, all the links are in here for this. I, I want you guys to see this, so we're going to wait. But this covers all the first three years of the robots that they started making using ROS. Um, some of the, the images and videos that people have been throwing out for, for um, isn't this cool, where you watch the quadcopters fly through the hoops and then go up and, and dodge the human head as the ball is flying over, catch the ball and toss it back to the human. That's all Ross. That's what they're using for it. Um, the, um, the videos where you've seen the, the dog, that robotic dog walking across the lava infested thing and avoiding the hot spots and doing that type of thing, that's all Ross. Uh, Again, because they didn't worry about the base anymore. They worried about solving the advanced problems. Like, like video. Like <laughs> video, not working. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh my god. And so this is, a, this is just the stuff over the past year. And of course it reset what I had queued. Um, so these are the advancements in the past year. Fighting lightsabers, that would be cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. Of course, that's a uh, $45,000 arm the guy's fighting with, so <laughs> so it's relative on a... <laughs> so he's not fighting hard. And so that's the actual robotic view. <clears throat> Quadcopter. And that's the... Uh, um, prairie dog? Yeah, that was oh. a prairie dog. Now you know why it costs four hundred thousand dollars, so it doesn't hurt you. <laughs> uh, this is something they're working on that is a uh, remote um, surgery with it. That's a turtle bot. Arm manipulators, both of them running on iCreates as their base platform. There are two in and out cards. Yeah. drink, having it delivered to where you are in the convention. It also opens them, but it's not as entertaining sometimes. It's solving it a could Rubik's be more Cube. It, it actually is quite entertaining. I have a video that you see that.
they actually have one where the uh, where the uh, robots are dancing. Two PR2s are dancing with each other. What's that conference you're at? That's IROS. It's a ROS conference that's he that's um, in May this year, right? May in St. Paul. Yeah. Minneapolis, St. Paul. <clears throat> and so this is the NXT, and it kind of gives you an idea. So this is what I was talking about. They built this, incorporated it in. This is actually using um, RViz. You can see the external camera. It's sonic sensor. This is what it sees and has currently mapped out as it moves. You can see that it's mapping out more of the area of the blocks that are around it. The idea behind this is now I can take this map that they're producing, store it. That's the map of my environment. Bring it up in another program, put in waypoints of where I want the robot to go, press play, and it goes through its known map and goes to the location you asked it to go to. Uh, and so that's the the basic. This is an NXT, 189 bucks. The um, question related to the panda board is here is your your um, any, well that's why it screws up, huh? That's awesome. All right. I actually had all these queued up, that's what sucks about this. So this is a panda board on a robot with a web camera that's controllable by a joystick that's connected to a computer elsewhere. Um, its platform is self-designed, as you can see. Somebody spent the time determining all the stuff. The thing that uh, I do know about this platform that's slightly different than probably what we do here is they actually know the motors and the controller encoders very well and those libraries actually existed already in ROS so they didn't actually have to do that logic again even though it looks like a, a, a rough cut based platform it's it's really not um, it uses the same stuff that other package platforms utilized um, so it's ugly looks cool and probably looks like a lot of our robots at that point <coughs> <coughs> oh, I hate the internet connection here. Join the club. You to plug in your phone. Yeah, it was running out. It was running out of battery. And so this is uh, one I showed last time. This is a humanoid being controlled by a connect uh, connect to a computer. So that's the humanoid there. He's going to control it by the Kinect seeing what he's doing and it's going to manipulate the humanoid robot accordingly. So as you can see, he's controlling it, the Kinect's reading it, that Roz is running on this box and communicating with the humanoid to actually do the work and, and act like he is in the back. An example of where this would be useful is uh, in a situation where it's dangerous for you to be in a location, for a human to be in a location, you send the robot in, it can act like you um, remotely. It's just a basic concept. <coughs> Any questions? No? Okay. And I'm going to play this small since it won't, so it won't requeue everything. Hi, I'm Jeremy Leaves. I'm a software engineer at Willow Garage, and I'm going to talk to you about logging and playback tools for ROS. Logging and playback are important features that are built directly into ROS. Whether you're a researcher collecting data sets, a developer testing algorithms, or a hardware engineer collecting diagnostic data, ROS enables you to capture data from any part of the system, save it to a file, and then replay it at a later date. In ROS, we call these files bag files, and we have a variety of tools to help you manage them. The ROS bag tool lets you record data from any ROS topic as well as play it back into the running ROS system. We also have the graphical tool RX bag, which lets you visually examine bag files. You can scan back and forth through the data and see plots, camera images, and raw messages. There are a variety of other tools for filtering, extracting, and updating bag files as well. We've already seen numerous interesting applications such as sending bag files to Amazon's Mechanical Turk service for data set labeling. The ROS bag and RX bag tools come with ROS, and you can find the documentation and tutorials on ROS.org. So the part I wanted to show, I wanted to highlight on that. ROS enables you to capture picture collecting data features that are built directly into. It's okay. This right here 
is uh, from a robot. This is all its camera feeds, its sensor feeds, its pressure feeds, and feeds, and the whole nine yards. In this scenario, let's say that you in this in this scenario they were doing a um, a grocery store setup where they're trying to put the things in the bag and they manipulated it wrong and didn't miss the bag on a particular object because it dropped it too early for the size of it. Now they can replay it through, figure out where their algorithm missed on the drop point and change it, play back the Roz bag and see that it would have done it correctly and then apply that to the robot. Now the robot will do it correctly without actually having the robot having to do it over and over again. Um, like let's say it's breaking a glass face, you don't kind of want to do that 20 times before you find out that you did it wrong. Or crashing a UAV 20 times. <laughs> Which I've done plenty of times myself. <laughs> um, and this is one of the other things that I really love about RISE. Hi, I'm Josh Faust, the software engineer at Little Garage. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about RBIS, our 3D visualization environment. RBIS lets us view what the robot is seeing, thinking, and doing. Developing on a robot can be very difficult without knowing exactly what the robot thinks is going on in the world. Debugging by looking at numbers scrolling by is difficult enough in 2D. Unless you have an intuitive understanding of quaternions and coordinate frames, debugging 3D by numbers alone is not much fun. Arvis lets you look at the world through the robot's eyes, whether those eyes are cameras, lasers, or joint encoders. There are two main ways of putting data inside Arvis's world. First, Arvis understands sensor and state information like laser scans, point clouds, cameras, and coordinate frames. And it's going to queue up forever here. Um, so this is the actual Arvis environment. We just demoed this at the <coughs> um, last, at the open Make house. The out, open house. With the Connect doing this, where you can actually see the room, the people walking into the room. The, at that point, you could take the data that the Connect is providing and go, okay, can you identify the objects in the room? Um, you can do that just by attaching the output of the camera to the point cloud library. It'll then take the information and try to determine what they are, and then they'll then be labeled here because you take the output of the point cloud library instead of the camera output and put it here, so on and so forth, each phase step up. So, up. so you can watch it at any point in the middle or at the ending result where it's actually making the real decisions. And this one's cool because it's uh, what we try to do all the time. Hi, my name is Aton Square and I work at Willow Garage on autonomous navigation and mapping. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the open source navigation stack that we've released as 1.0. <coughs> the navigation stack was designed with openness and cross-platform support in mind. This means so that this we is hope the you'll be able to use the robot navigation view. stack on anything from a platform as small as an iRobot Create to something as large and with as many sensors as a PR2. You can configure it to use different sensors, change the model or footprint of your robot, and use a three-dimensional or two-dimensional view of the world as needed for your application. In particular, the three-dimensional view of the world enables the robot to avoid obstacles like tables, chairs, and people's feet. This is a significant improvement over navigation stacks that view the world as purely planar. Overall, we tried to make the navigation stack as flexible as possible. <coughs> we also included the ability to track unknown space in the world. This means that as your robot rounds a corner, it knows that the space around that corner is unseen. This allows the robot to slow down intelligently in situations where it needs to gain more knowledge about the world or its environment. The navigation stack is also now simultaneous localization and mapping friendly. This means that you can use your favorite SLAM system and hopefully with minor modifications, plug it in to use Willow's open source navigation stack. If you don't have a SLAM system, you should check out the SLAM G mapping package as it provides one that already interfaces with the navigation stack and should be easy to use. Overall, that's the navigation stack. It's the same code that we use here at Willow on the PR2 it's the same code that allowed our robot to complete 26.2 miles of autonomous navigation for our Milestone 2 effort. You can check us out on ROS.org. All the code's open source, and you should feel free to download or use it as you like. Can't hurt that unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the... Watch this. <laughs> 
Hope he isn't wearing anything transparent. So, man, I really wish that you were in good shape because that would be cool. Can't you plug your phone into your and use the networking through USB? Yeah, I can, but it's only 3G here, so it's just as crappy as the regular. I got a 4G one, but it's not going to be much faster. Well, the 4G here, it's not. It's, for me, it's, it does. I don't get it. So. I'll barely get it. <laughs> I'll barely get it. Yeah. And so this one, as I was trying to show you earlier. Oh, come on, play. <laughs> it's LiDAR based. Mapping out is complete environment. <coughs> this is the actual 3D visualization. The other one was the slam mapping modules. You've seen that part of the video. Uh, this is what they did in the three years of Roz and all the robots that were involved in it. And can you make it past this point? Because I really want to show them the Google autonomous car that's driving. Yeah, down that was going to be my question. I was about to ask you. Is that what they use the Google autonomous car? <laughs> it's at the end oh, of this yes. video, and I really want you guys to see a car traveling at 70 miles an hour that's mapping <coughs> its environment completely and avoiding obstacles. Including police. <laughs> <laughs> Quadcopters and how they're mapping the different layers of the room. I'm sure you've seen that video before. That's awesome. <laughs> Try doing that with an Arduino. <laughs> so you see it's recognizing the objects based on the point cloud. It's able to determine that that's tied literally by the picture on it and a bit different than the actual uh, uh, downy that's sitting right next to it mm -hmm. based on the color labels and so the yeah. and so I got I'm sure you guys have seen the little nail robot that actually uses Ross as part of its foundation too so you have any libraries that can read books um, OCR recognition, recognition has been put into place, um, but it's uh, um, the limitations currently are the hardware, not necessarily the software. Hmm. Uh, being able to determine the letters with video easily enough. Manipulation with chopsticks. I can see someone building that. Doug. Uh, folding clothes. <laughs> That's all we, well, we got in robotics for, right? So That's we can right. do our dishes and laundry and put it away. Just, just waiting to. This right here, I'll pause it right here. This is uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight in this video. This arm, as you can see, looks kind of something familiar to some what something would build in this room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, in fact, it is actually using a lot of things that he he utilizes for the smaller robots on a much larger scale. The, he uses servos and um, stepper motors um, tied in Wi-Fi to this machine, so it's actually doing what the human is manipulating. Um, it doesn't need the human in there either. The human is in there to train it only. It's about four grand if you bought it, all the parts and put it together. And this is them dancing. There's your uh, Google autonomous car. <laughs> They've done things with the autonomous car to the point that in the, in, in, the, the, in the research I've done, 70 miles an hour traveling an unknown road with obstacles getting in the way, paying attention to red, green, and yellow lights and stop signs, and properly traversing over 100 miles doing so on public highways with other traffic and vehicles on the road. How did they get the permits for that? There was a human that was sitting behind the steering wheel in case something went bad. So it was still a human controlled environment, not purely um, the, 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 
the other stuff isn't allowed yet to where you can just throw a car out there and do it. Like a shooting driver. There's a, there's a good article in the latest Wired magazine called Let the Car Do the Driving, and it talks about, and it got a decent in-depth uh, discussion of Google's autonomous car, and they put like 20,000 miles on California and and um, Nevada highways. They, they worked with the Nevada legislature to craft the autonomous vehicle legislation in Nevada. I bet the uh, collision uh, metrics were a lot lower, right, as far as... Had a lot less accidents with autonomous vehicles, right? <laughs> and so this is one of the topics that's an advanced robotics topic. Uh, this is actually using uh, 3D mapping. 3D sensors such as stereo cameras or the Kinect device generate large amounts of data, typically millions of points per second. For this kind of data to be useful in a robotic system, it needs to be integrated into one consistent model of the environment. To this end, we developed a probabilistic 3D mapping framework based on mock trees. It represents obstacles as well as free space and unknown areas. Our software has been optimized both for memory efficiency and for runtime speed. This allows us to model large-scale environments on standard hardware. We are able to update maps in real time so they can be used for online collision avoidance, for instance, on the PR2. We are also able to use more than one sensor to update the map. By embedding several maps in a hierarchical structure, we can represent individual objects at a very fine level of detail. If you want to use Octomap in your own 3D projects, check out our open source library at Ross.org. And again, so the idea there is you could take their library, plug it out from your camera feed, into their library and get the results that they've been fine-tuning for this whole time. With you just making a message pass from this node to this node. There's some important websites, the wiki, the answers.raz is really nice. Um, they cover a whole lot of things related to I screwed up and I can't install this package. Um, you can search it. It's, it's kind of like a Stack Overflow Q&A style place. Um, and if there isn't your, your answers aren't there, you can ask the question and it will uh, provide the result. It, it, there's hundreds of people who like to provide the results for that. And I'm not going to do Q&A yet because Paul's going to do his demonstration first. Oh, one other thing I wanted to cover. Um, it's a, a device probably not many people in this room have, and I understand that. This is an Arduino device. Okay, It's a 250 megahertz processor. It has half a gig of RAM in it and 8 gig of storage. Um, it's interfaced to talk to the robot. It's right back here. Or my wrist, as I put it on the watch. This has the capability of talking to that Android phone which is sitting on a robot, so I can now control and watch what's happening with the robot on this little tiny thing. Wow. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> There's already a ROS module for this. Which unit is that? This is a WIM developer one. It's a, You can only buy the developer version currently. Um, I'm actually, I actually code applications for this for sale. So do they have any bionic implants yet? <laughs> <laughs> but, so the idea is, is your Arduino device doesn't have to be this. It can be this. There you go. Wow. <laughs> Android. Sorry. I said Arduino, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. Your Arduino device is. <laughs> yeah, it's like. Uh, <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's a really powerful. Uh, uh, your, your Android device can be this instead of the phone. Um, okay. This is actually more expensive than the $23 phone I was describing. Actually, with the new M3 version of it, it might be that way. Um, is there any questions while Paul's setting up for his thing? Yeah, I have one question, um, yeah, but. Jason. Um, in the cases of where they're doing the uh, SLAM, yeah. do you know, do, can you get away with just having the IMU on the uh, on the, the robot yep. and then have the filtering all done on SLAM? So That's you, actually how it happens in most ROS so cases you can, today. So like the $50 IMU you can get away with and not the Or the, or the $23 cell phone. Yeah. That is your yeah. IMU too. Yeah. With okay. camera. Okay. Mm -hmm.
I want to ask you about that later. Yeah. Um, so, so one of the things I'll, uh, I can go over now, which is fine. We are going to do this a little bit different. This is a talk about RAWs. That's great. Um, none of you know how to do anything about it after you walk out of this room, right? <laughs> um, so over the next two months, we're going to be doing Tuesday and Saturday classes that are going to cover loading the Linux on your laptop, getting a base platform that can talk to it, probably Arduino, maybe VEX Pro, I don't know, I really haven't figured that out yet. Using the Connect, producing a robot that does the results and actually utilizing the libraries and doing it. The idea is, is that probably within the, the next couple months, and I'll send them out well in advance, where we'll go over how to get it set up, configured, and do workshops that allow you to build build a robot that utilizes this technology with stuff you already have at home, most likely. One quick question. Yeah. If, because you're going to do this on Tuesdays and Saturdays. Uh, I'll say it, I'll send it well out in advance. But. Yeah, yeah, I understand. But uh, since a lot of us can put the Linux on ourselves, what version do you recommend for us to put on? I mean, it sounds like a Ubuntu, but I'm not sure which one. Would you let it want to go with the newest one, or 10.4, or 11? I use 11.10, even though we said that it's not supported. So you're saying go with the newest? Um, mm -hmm. I use 11.10. Yeah. <laughs> I go with whatever's easiest. To I would use 11.4. 11.4? Yeah. Okay. For someone who has no preconceived knowledge of what they're doing, okay. because it plugs in a lot easier. 11.10 actually requires some work. To get it working with, um, it, it, you have to know how to write and load the right package libraries. And not that it's hard to copy and paste it from a website because that's really all you got to do to get it working. But uh, uh, example is I've seen that that's not exactly as user friendly as they try to make it seem like on the wiki. Correctly, like, yeah. Uh, we have a couple guys who've gone through it recently. Yeah, yeah. Eleven four would be where I'd start. One click install, kind of thing. No, so again, again, it's not Windows. This is not Windows. This is not next, 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 next. It's close. Copy and paste all the commands. Yes. All right. One, one um, script install. Um, to do to do the to do the Ubuntu install, I actually do a Windows style based install. I, I don't build USB sticks or SD cards. I put a 30 gig block on my box, and I use Wubi, which basically. Uh, is a Windows install for Ubuntu creates a uh, a big file that is now your Ubuntu partition and it'll load up and, and extract it out and utilize it live. I can actually show you that today if you guys want because I have it set up and configured. Sure Wubi's badass. It's basically turns your machine into a dual boot machine but without the partitioning. What about VMs? So uh, VMs is what Paul uses and what I used before I discovered Wubi. The reason why I stepped away from the VM world is uh, I have. Uh, I'm probably in a unique position. I have access to hundreds of machines if I want to. Oh, okay. um, and so um, <clears throat> part of the machines that I utilize for it, running it in a VM, I could not get enough control of the hardware for the 3D uh, calculations that I'm using the GPU for, um, that, that Ross is using the, three, the, the GPU for. Uh, virtualization extrapolates that layer, and you can't have the finite control. So it's not just... Well, it's like CUDA to, to, to do a three-point call library calculation so it actually can send up a smaller package of what object you're looking at. Um, they have, they have a, a CUDA code that takes the point cloud library and let it face down to a smaller level so the package sent up to Google Goggles is, is extremely small, tight, fast. It comes back within milliseconds instead of seconds. Uh, um, so sorry, but that's really high you spell up there. What's, what, you said W-U-B-I. .exe and it's a Ubuntu supported part of their base package. Um, you just got to go click on it and install it. If you're tired of running Ubuntu and you don't want to do a bolt anymore, you go up to it and double click and uninstall and it removes it. So um, it's very easy to use and you don't have to worry about partitioning or slow USB sticks or SD cards. Now obviously, you can add packages to it. Oh, yeah, it's just like running Linux okay. in its own partition, except for you say only this 18 gig. Are you allowed to use uh, without having to go? Okay, let me move the data over, slice the partition, set up U-boot mm -hmm. or Grub or whatever else you're going to go through. It does all that automatically for you. Plugs. It doesn't use the real Grub. It uses a Grub that plugs into the NT loader that Windows has. So, mm. so it's Grub, but not Grub. Maybe better for you. 
sorry that you guys went through all that crap for me to say movie this week. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the difference in between going the VM route and the route that I'm describing is, is no sharing, where in Paul's VM world he can share in between what's on his Windows desktop and what's there. I can't because Windows is not loaded up. Yeah. This is um, I, this projector is sending my laptop into spasms and <laughs> it keeps on. It looks like it keeps on doing that. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, very weird. Um, do you want to do it to the TV? Sure, let's give that a go. It's right there. It should be. Okay, yeah, now you got it. You got it. Is it turned on? Um, it will be in a second. Let there be light. This will work. Okay. Um, so what I've what I've got here is one of Dale Wheat's Arduino's um, with a little sketch on it that's doing uh, flashing light, and it's a minor minor modification of uh, of the the most basic uh, the most basic uh, Arduino uh, example. Um, so let me back up a bit. What, what I'd recommend you do if you're starting with ROS is read the ROS, go through the ROS tutorials to learn about ROS and topics and all the things that, that Jason's been talking about, services, messages, uh, you know, what those concepts are and how they relate to one another. And then there's a, another set of tutorials on Arduino, which are, which are, which are quite, quite well written. Um, and what uh, Arduino obviously doesn't have networking built in, and yet ROS is centrally about networking. The way, the way it works is um, they've got a library on Arduino that, uh, that takes requests from your application, from your sketch, um, to publish, publish uh, topics, send messages out to a topic, um, accept service requests and make service requests, um, and that goes, uh, calls into the library which uses a serial port on the Arduino, speeds it up to 57k, um, and you wire the serial port up to your PC. Um, I'm actually running, running uh, Ubuntu in a virtual machine on, on top of Windows, uh, running uh, Ubuntu 10.11.04. Uh, uh, um, the key to this is the ROS proxy. So they run a proprietary um, ser uh, protocol over the serial link, that is resistant to unplugging the cable and you know the sorts of things that you do with, with um, with serial cables from Arduino's, and um, it effectively uh, connects the services and the topics that you publish from your app into the ROS through through the ROS core into into the ROS apps running out on your PC or elsewhere on, on multiple networks on the system, and um, so that's that's what's going on here, and so what I'm going to do now is demo uh, demo it actually running and uh, just change my resolution so it can stuff gets a bit bigger risky thing here but we'll give it a go Okay, so um, so this is a, a very simple little sketch that publishes on on a topic called chatter. It's just you know, almost exactly from the from the first tutorial, um, and uh, it, so it and so we need to start off ROS core and make make sure ROS core is working first, which it is. Um, ROS core is the um, program that advertises all the services and the topics and, and lets uh, other programs query what topics exist um, and, and uh, coordinates the publishing uh, to those topics. And then what we do is we start the, um, start the proxy and to do that we, so uh, Okay, so I've got USB serial here um, hooked into the virtual machine. So an, an aspect of 
that, that's important when using um, USB serial hooked to a virtual machine is when I want to reprogram the Arduino I have to detach the USB serial from the virtual machine because I don't have Arduino loaded on on Linux yet I haven't figured out how to do that so I program the Arduino from Windows and then then reattach USB to the virtual machine and away we go so um, the program ROS run tells it to run a ROS, a ROS program. ROS serial Python is the proxy that uh, that runs uh, on Linux. Um, serial node .py, I'm sorry, that's a package. Serial node .py is the is the um, proxy program, and then you give it the TTY port to use, and it connects, um, and it says down here. Publisher, but publisher on Chatter. Chatter is the uh, is the name of the topic that the Arduino is publishing to, and then there's a useful topic, ROS topic echo chat echo, and you name, give it a topic name, and it prints everything out that um, that is coming out on that topic, and so he's uh, he's got a, um, a, a simple print loop. So what I'm demonstrating here is um, an Arduino sketch publishing a string, it could be a debug string is, is really how I envision using it, um, with some variable data um, off to a ROS topic. Uh, now, an interesting thing to do here, um, okay, so let me just stop that and stop that proxy and disconnect the USB device and now we'll get to something that's really interesting for robotics and that is a modification to the to the scheme um, that I was that I was just using so I'll take my Arduino USB cable here and hook it up to Chumbi which just has a, a power a power cord um, into it, so the Chumbi is on the DMS Wi-Fi link, and I got a little USB thingy out the back. Okay, so Arduino through Chumbi, and uh, and um, what I'm going to do now is start up a serial daemon that uh, takes serial data from the Chumbi's TTY um, and passes it, makes it available on a TCP/IP socket. Um, and then I, I just modified ROS proxy, the ROS proxy program, um, to log in over TCP instead of going directly out to a TTY port. So the result, the net of this is that you get network access to um, Arduino, uh, Arduino code. Okay, so. Instead of running ROS, ROS run ROS serial Python is the package, serial node.py is the name of the proxy. Um, I'm going to run ROS run ROS serial UDP. So um, Jason was talking about packages, how easy it is to make a package and just put your source code in it. Well, I did that. I made a package and um, copied the, the uh, serial uh, the, the Python for serial node.py modified it to uh, establish a t TCP connection instead of using a TDY and uh, give it the IP address and uh, what's going on here? Ah, I didn't start the daemon. Okay, so ROS serial D dot um, SH is a shell script that starts the serial to uh, network daemon, and so it's um, it's uh, connecting slash dev slash TTY USB zero to one ninety two one sixty eight one dot one twenty five, which is the IP address that the Chumbi has on the makerspace, and so now we'll 
run this one more time. Okay, what's going on? Wrong, wrong program. Okay, it initialized the socket. Um, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> um, message data. Let me try the master reset. <coughs> okay. Um, I do find, I don't know why I'm getting um, a number of frequent packet fail messages, but I am. But here it says it set up the publisher on Chatter. So it did actually communicate with the, with the um, Arduino and, uh, and recognize the, the package Chatter. And so um, I think we'll see, um, yeah, so, so by running, on, on running RAS on Unix, we're now um, picking up the, the um, topic that's being published by the Arduino um, all over over Wi-Fi from from an Arduino so it's an inter interesting way to collect um, collect log data um, it's also Jason was talking about about um, about bag files um, uh, So you can there's a uh, if you run ros bag uh, record minus a um, so it's uh, it says it recognizes what topics exist ros um, bag you're telling it to record everything with the minus a flag it uh, recognizes that chatter is a topic that it can subscribe to so you can be you can both um, echo the topic and record it to your, to a bag file same simultaneously. For the for the um, you know watch it and be able to replay it kind of uh, kind of um, experience that, that uh, Jason was describing. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll quit the bag file and um, and now we'll quit. We'll exit out of our proxy and stop uh, stop listening to Arduino. Um, now an interesting thing to do is to do a ROS topic echo chatter. Um, okay, so we're listening for messages on chatter now. Nothing, nothing's coming out. Um, now we can go over and do a ROS bag play, and the file name is. You've got to type in. What? Look at you. I think you might have typed Yeah, plan instead of play. Thank you. Yes, it is. Um, okay, so it's playing now, playing the data back that it recorded, and and things were working right. Uh, okay, I don't know why this is working, isn't working, but it should have been picking up chatter messages. Um, Can you turn it back on? No, you didn't get the chatter until about a minute in. All right, all right. I, I don't know why it's. Uh, I'm confused now. I um, to, so maybe rather than de debug it right now, I, th I think you get the idea. Um, had working this morning, and you know, obviously I've screwed it up. You know, pressure of the demo. You know how that goes. You didn't start it until midnight again, so it's not. Oh. It's playing silence. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So anyway, um, a few quick demos of the kinds of things that Joseph, Jason was talking about. You can do um, fairly straightforward. Uh, there are quite a lot of commands, but really recommend reading the uh, running the tutorials. And the, there's also an introduction to concepts. It talks about um, what topics are, what what services are, and and uh, recommend reading the, them. Once you get through them, you'll have a decent idea of what it's all about. Any questions? Back to you. All right. 
So, so the uh, uh, the idea of doing the uh, um, sessions at later dates to, to building an actual Roz based robot, or is there anybody interested in that? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. So, uh, so I have a couple questions because I'm uh, designing the, the base of this uh, uh, classes and uh, uh, going through it. What platform would you guys like to do it on? And I don't mean in the sense of what computer. I mean as in the base robotic platform. Um, NXT is a, a popular choice here locally. Um, Arduino. I have, I have a, I can, uh, so. What, uh, so, so let me explain to you kind of my idea, and you guys can tell me if this will work for you. Is part of the part of the thing is it's expensive to build the mobile platform, or you just go buy it for this thing, and you really don't know what's going to happen out of the result, right? But most people here have a computer. I uh, hope so. Okay. Um, and do you guys have a couple webcams? Yeah, oh, we can probably get some. twelve years old. Okay, yeah. for for ten bucks to buy a couple from yeah. Deal Extreme and get it shipped from China. Yeah, there you go. Okay, um, so what I would like to do is do stereo stereoscopic viewing with a computer you bring in that's running Linux, being able to do point cloud mapping, mapping of a room, and those type of things. Now, the mapping of the room, unfortunately, is going to be you walking it around. Because I'm not going to worry about a platform that you're going to put mobility on. That'll be your problem. So if you want to use an NXT, an iCreate, or whatever the case may be, spend five years building your own base platform, that's fine. And when you're done, it'll be able to tell you what the room looks like. Um, so uh, that way we don't have to worry about everybody having the same base platform. Does that sound like a good idea? Yes. Yes. That way you guys can see yeah. how it actually, actually uses. And, yeah. and I can bring in maybe some of the base platforms that I have that match it, which is, is an example, the iCreate. Um, the NXT and things like that where you can just put the, the devices that are doing this on top of it and, and do the work. Uh, one of the demonstrations I wanted to use is, a, is your smartphone. Would that be cool too? So you guys get an idea of how to put get an Arduino, maybe uh, one of the base setups with the uh, two motors on it and caster wheel at the back. Arduino phone sitting on top controlling it. Did you? Android. I'm sorry. Android, Android phone. <laughs> I do. You got <laughs> Yes. Um, so for it was a late night. Webcams, 640 by 480, or should they? Since, since you two. can get since you can get high definition ones so cheap now. It doesn't just matter. go for them. Yeah. the The idea is is all. Uh, it's, it depends on how much processing power you're going to put behind it. Um, what we'll do is we'll come in and we'll build the base stereo platform which is a place where you mount the cameras to so it has the right angles for stereoscopic view mm -hmm. and then plug them in and point to start putting them into the into the system to where you can determine 3D objects, faces, distance, um, and uh, build some slam mapping. Um, a, a point that's probably important I guess for camera selection is to make sure it's Linux compatible. Yeah, uh, I can send some links around when we talk about the class on cameras that are acceptable. Okay. They cost four bucks. Okay, uh, it's not hard. Um, um, the cheap stuff actually works better than the more expensive stuff when it comes to the Linux world. Um, like a Linux ATF, like a Logitech ATF uh, orbit generally doesn't work very well with the Linux box. It'll be it has 360 degrees zooming and the whole other night stuff. It's a ninety dollar camera. You don't extra have to go that far, <laughs> right? The extra functionality is the part. So. Um, so, is, so is that a good idea? We can yeah. do it like a few weeks apart of each other and have conversations on the list about working through the issues you guys are working through. Tuesdays and Saturdays, or is there better days for everybody else here? We have the same class repeated on Tuesday and Saturday, or eighth class. On It'd be Tuesday. so. The idea would be like two weeks from now, we can do a Linux one. How to get Wubi loaded on there, so you're dual booting Linux without having to repart repartition your stuff. You don't want to show up for that one. Cool. Okay. Two weeks after that one, maybe on a Saturday, we'll do how to hook up to stereo stereo copy this. Uh, the, the two cameras to your box. <laughs> and then the next week, maybe how to take that output and put it into point cloud libraries. And next week after that is how to utilize those point cloud libraries to do something. Just, just, can you get away with using a USB hub? Yeah. Otherwise, so, because a lot of us, a lot of the, some of the inexpensive uh, can, uh, laptops don't have a whole lot of ports. Yeah, as long as it's a USB 2.0, because the actual bandwidth required for a camera that's 640 by 480 is actually minimal. It's a little over 2 megabits, and two of them on a, t a single 10 to 100 megabit channel is cheap. So. Okay, all right.
Yeah. Maybe you throw a class in there for Connect or? Yeah, so I, uh, Connect is fine too. Uh, uh, you know, we could do, you can bring a Connect and it's actually easier because it does all the stereoscopic for you. As did uh, 150 to $250 versus <laughs> um, this is really what I was kind of trying to go for, so it may be an investment for something. How, how do you, you compare the two? The the, well, the Connect is badass. Yeah. That's, that's how I compare the two. That, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess <laughs> aside from that... The, the $8 cameras suck. Okay, so, so comparatively. Okay. <laughs> well, because the Connect is a whole nother ball game. I mean, you got the stereoscopic view and your IR plane that, that allows it to determine yes. distance by the size of the dots. There's, there's a whole host of things with the Connect that you're not going to reproduce with stereoscopic uh, webcam. Is there any, since we're doing it in, since November might be an out, outdoor competition, yep. is there any outdoor inexpensive uh, platforms that arise? Yeah. Can you name one? <laughs> PR2, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would kind of get the stuck. NXT is a prime example of an outdoor based one. Okay. By big wheels. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, no, I mean, seriously. Uh, yeah. Eric's yeah. one works. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. Yeah. it's a prime example. He yeah, uses I know. It. I, know. Uh, I don't uh, like Legos. Mine's filling box. So uh, sure. No, no argument. <laughs> no argument there. There's other ones too, but most of those. Uh, most of the ones that really get into the heavier you know, outdoor are going to cost more than the computers you're using to drive the thing, so thousands of dollars. What about your work that you guys did with the VEX Super whatever it is, Super Pro? Well, that's a $350 controller to begin yeah, with. I know. Um, <laughs> Maybe we can get one. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, um, but the mechanics is the real issue, yeah. right? I mean, that's what you're asking about. Well, the, see, the thing is, though, is so the whole reason you choose known platforms is so you don't have to go through the fine-tuning process that, that they spent the hundreds yeah, of hours Yeah, but you showed the guy where you, if you knew so, the right number, the right motors and, and encoders, you probably wouldn't have to mess with that. Probably and then probably, a couple weeks, and yeah. probably the mm -hmm. difference between... Even if you're using the motors in the libraries, they got a couple of weeks of mapping out the exact... Yeah. You know, yeah. diameters and the turn yeah. radiuses and those type of things and plug it into the calibration we can just algorithms. Take our, take our wheels on it. Um, <laughs> well, so. <laughs> we got the tiny wire for, uh, Me personally, the way I'd probably attack it is I'd go to Walmart and buy a $29 remote control car, rip the top yeah. off of it, throw yeah. an Arduino on it, put an Android phone on top. And, okay. And, right. and, and then spend some time on, on the actual mechanics of the control of it. Um, but okay, your mileage may vary. Yeah. We already have platforms. <laughs> be in the, in the um, and I'm sure there's actually people who have done that similarly. Um, I just don't yeah. know. Yeah. Had, yeah, there's Roz. Roz actually right now has right around uh, 4,000 base packages. Um, about 1,500 of them deal with platforms to run on. Um, mm. I don't know, unfortunately. For a little bit more now, SparkFun has a mobile six-wheel platform that they sell. And yeah, I forget. Is it called Yeah, it's got it's got platform. big monster wheel uh, tires and then suspension. In each each uh, oh, wheel is. Is it, is it the Dagu oh, yeah. setup? Yeah. I think it's called the Weld Thumper. I think it that's, yeah. that's, that's the yeah. Dagu. Okay, um, you can actually build that one. You don't need to order it. It's a couple hundred bucks, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, like two hundred fifty. Yeah. Um, you, so so if it's the one that I remember. Um, the, the, um, it, all it really was to begin with is uh, six T's with the motors mounted into the T's directly connected with gear connected to the wheels, um, screwed into four of the um, three uh, three of the base plates for um, what's the? Uh, How do you spell it? How do you spell Dagu D A G U? Okay. Um, but it's, uh, it's they call it the Walt Thumper. They call it the Thumper, Thumper. Yeah. Uh, but it, that's the model of the the Dag is the guy who's who distribute uh, who bought it for the person who made it. But it's uh, the I don't know if you guys have seen the base plates where you third one down. Doesn't this Palulu sell that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. This is it's a, it's uh, it's uh, Spark Fund's about four years late to the. Uh, <laughs> selling this chassis world. Um, so this design, click on this right here. Um, on that one. 
Yeah. yeah. Perfect. And then enlarge it. Yeah. Uh, we can actually make this, if you guys are interested in making this, we don't actually have to buy a $250 worth. The, the, the actual cost to make this is a little less than 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. Okay. These things are metal plates. Um, the original design was five plates of the plastic uh, variety. I'm trying to remember that company that does that stuff. Um, the ones where you go to fries and you buy the little bulldozer that picks the thing up and has the remotes. Yeah, tomorrow. So they, they have base plates that are just a flat plate. You melt the side with a uh, lighter, bend it, and then you mount the independent suspension on the sides screwed together all the way back. That is the actual original design of this. Dagu saw the person making this online said, hey, sell that design to us and we'll make some money and you can make some money. We have a plastic bender so, over here that's mm -hmm. made for bending plastic. But see, that's even better than my lighter <laughs> trick that I've been using. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we have a laser cutter. So. Yeah. But so, so um, I made this platform about five years ago when the guy was first doing it. It cost me a little less than 50 bucks then. Um, so we could do stuff like that too. Um, that's a good outdoor one. It's, mm -hmm. it's independent. The suspension really isn't uh, here. It's in the fact that all the parts move. So the, the, the top one could be to the left and to the right while the back two are still straight and haven't got to the part where it's going. What, are, what are the motors? Are they um, continuous just, rotation just, servos? No, they're, no, it's a DC motor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah controlled by an H bridge. Oh. So it's a. Oh, it's, is it just one or three? It's a motor in each cylinder, so there's six. Oh, it's all gear. Motor? It's all metal gear uh, construction. Yeah. Yeah. Their new product video uh, from two weeks ago has a, a pretty neat video of, of that platform driving over piles of rubble. Yeah, and yeah. it, I mean, it's, it's pretty powerful. They actually attached a potato cannon to it. And they launched some uh, <laughs> potatoes into this cool. Yeah, so we could build stuff like that in house. All the parts you can buy. Um, and we can probably do some vacuum forming plastic instead uh, to make the chassis parts of it. But all the parts that, um, um, when I did it, bought these um, Hobby Lobby, the T, Home Depot, Motor, Hobby Lobby. Um, and it was very cheap and very inexpensive to put a, an outdoor platform together. Uh, we can do something like that too, a class over how to get all that done. And, that'd, be, and, uh, that'd be awesome. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't mind even buying the thing because I get all the pots. Well, it's easy enough to make, though. That's the thing. I mean, it really is. It was, it was a, a lighter and, and a table yeah. and some screws. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was so stupid, yeah. simple, and scary. Um, but yeah, so the suspension really works by these, the, all these modules being independent of each other, not the fact that it actually has. Uh, so you're saying there's ROS integration for that platform? I didn't say that. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. You're saying using an Arduino to drive. Yeah, I'm saying I would use like an Arduino to drive something along that line. So of course, I would have done a $29 car from Walmart and just ripped the top off and mounted it myself. But if you wanted 12 or 24 wheels, or <laughs> but if you want real outdoor, then, um, no, Roz. I don't know that Roz. Actually, Roz might plug it straight into this. The Dagu. You know the H bridges and everything. You did it for 50. Yeah. Well, an L293 is not that much money. Yeah. <laughs> or 298 oh, if you yeah. want to pump up some high, mode, some high mode, you know, and then throw in a couple resistors and some LEDs and a capacitor to keep the flow from the PWM signals going. So, uh, part, uh, yeah, that, you know, honestly, the most expensive part was the wheels, not even the motors, uh, because I used uh, um, uh, solar biotics motors four dollars with the gears already built into it, little things like this and, and so the wheels cost me more with the tires that was the most expensive part of it and waiting for the stuff to come from china for the plates other than that or maybe the screws were the most expensive part of it. <laughs> so this may be a bit off the topic of, yes of, completely uh, off the of topic Roz. of Roz, but for an outdoor competition which is what yeah. he was asking yeah because yeah, i'm saying is, i mean that would be about the right timing, November. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't talked about that in the committee yet. Yeah, but so. I'm just saying that, well, you'd have to have at least that amount of time.